Well, good morning, everyone. This is August Rosado with Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries. We want to thank you so much for tuning in on this Thursday morning. It's a very warm morning coming to you live from my main headquarters here in Lincoln, Rhode Island. I apologize for the late start uh, this morning, but we're going to be uh, going into part two of the interpretation of Bible prophecy, why it is very important to have a proper biblical hermeneutic when we study Bible prophecy. And I see that my friend from Sweden, Anders Ekman, is with us today. Anders, I'm sorry that we could not hook up there in Israel. When I was in the north, you were in the south. When we were in the south, you were in the north. And uh, we just could not meet. Hopefully down the road we'll be able to do it again, brother. But I hope you had a great time over there in Israel because we sure did. So great to see Anders Ekman. And uh, we have Daniel K. Bean with us. Calvin Murchison is with us. Greg Young, <clears throat> Deborah Wyatt, and uh, Sultan Gill. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us on this Thursday morning. Now, don't forget tomorrow, Friday, uh, we'll be having, as usual, Prophecy Q&A. Friday Prophecy Q&A. And so don't forget to join us tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time as I will take on your Bible prophecy question. So if you have a Bible prophecy question, maybe something that's been eating at you for a long time, and you're like, well, we're going to try to ask Brother Rosado, see if he might be able to answer it. We will try to answer it. And so uh, bring those prophecy questions with you uh, tomorrow for Friday. Prophecy Q&A, call up a friend, invite a friend, have them join us live if they have a Facebook account because my page is public and the uh, video live streaming is also public as well. So that will be your opportunity to ask a Bible prophecy question tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That doesn't mean you can't ask a prophecy question during this uh, broadcast. You can ask a prophecy question anytime that you want. But Friday, we designate that day for Friday Prophecy Q&A. And so remember to have those questions ready for tomorrow morning. Great to see Cindy Whitehead with us. Cindy, good to see you. Good morning uh, to you. And so uh, the week is blown by. It's great to be home. And so we are so uh, looking forward to our time here at home to spend time with friends and family. And so we really look forward to uh, doing that. And so, again, I hope you have your Bibles ready for this morning. I hope they have them paper ready. And uh, go along with us as we look at the interpretation of Bible prophecy, part two. When you have an opportunity, follow me on the social media networks. You're already doing that on Facebook. And as I said already, my page is public. Uh, the, the live streaming videos are public. But then you can also follow me on YouTube. We have a little over 300 videos. Yes, I'm not exaggerating. We have over 300 videos on YouTube of all of my Bible prophecy teaching from Israel. You know, we just uploaded a recent video from Israel that I taught uh, there at biblical sites in the Holy Land like Caesarea, Shiloh, in the central part of the state of Israel, Bethel, which is about 20 minutes uh, north of uh, Shiloh. And so you can check out all of those videos, all of my videos from Israel. We have some videos that we did with Dr. Todd Baker from Rome. <clears throat> I also have some joint uh, Bible teaching with Todd Baker from Israel. And, of course, all of these Facebook live streaming videos we upload to YouTube. Also on my uh, Facebook page, we just uploaded a couple of more videos <clears throat> of a Bible prophecy conference that I just did in Laurel Springs, North Carolina, with my dear friend, uh, Pastor Jesus Padilla, and the people of Gethsemane Baptist Church. So uh, we just uploaded uh, those videos. It's an all Spanish church I preached at. I can't speak Spanish. But my friend Jesus was interpreting for me. And uh, him and I just worked so very well uh, when I'm at his church. It was at least five years since I've been at his church. 
And I don't know why it's just been so long, but I said, you know, if we don't go back again in the fall, then we have to make it a twice annual prophecy conference there in a Laurel Springs, North Carolina. Then, of course, I preached at Miracle Baptist Church in Sanford, North Carolina. Henry Fonkhauser, his wife Sarah, and their people over there. So we had a wonderful time over there with them, with them as well. So on my YouTube, we have over 300 video, uh, videos that we have there. Just go to August Rosado on YouTube. And then look at all of my late-breaking news stories that we put on my Twitter page. You can follow me on Twitter, August Rosado at Bible underscore prophecy is my Twitter handle. And I list all the late-breaking news stories right there on Twitter. Again, my Twitter handle, August Rosado at Bible underscore prophecy. And then if you get into LinkedIn, you can follow me as Evangelist August Rosado on LinkedIn. So again, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn are the four social networks you could follow me on. You know, some people say, well, why don't you try Snapchat? Or why don't you try Instagram? And I really don't get into any of them right there. But four social media networks is more than enough. And so you guys can follow me uh, on that. If you're a pastor of a church, a good, uh, solid, independent, fundamental Bible-believing church, and you'd like to have me come to your church for the fall for a one-day Bible prophecy conference or a multi-day conference, then you can get a hold of me on Facebook uh, Messenger, or you can send me an email, august.todayinbibleprophecy at gmail.com. Or you can go to my contact form on my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Good to see Anthony Parker with us over there in Gulfport, Mississippi, as well as Lori Manus. Good to see all of you as well. And so, uh, again, you can get a hold of me through there if you're a pastor and you'd like to have me come to your church to talk about eschatology, the doctrine of last things, uh, to look at current world events in light of biblical prophecy. That's what we'll do. And if you know me, I teach Bible prophecy for its plain sense interpretation. No more, no less. You never get any drama, hyper sensationalism with me. I don't, I actually, I don't tolerate that at all. And as I said, you know, in our teaching yesterday, that one of the most abused subjects in the church today among Christians and prophecy teachers is Bible prophecy. It's a very abused subject in the church. And that's the reason why we're doing this uh, study on the interpretation. Of Bible prophecy. It's very important that we have a proper biblical hermeneutic when we study the scriptures, especially Bible prophecy. Now, don't forget, guys, we're, we, we're putting together a Bible prophecy tour to Israel, March 24th to April the 3rd, 2019. And we already have multiple people that said, August, we're going with you. And we just Put the itinerary, the brochure, on our website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. So go to my website when you have an opportunity. Click on the Israel Prophecy Tour, Israel Petra Prophecy Tour. Look at the itinerary. Look at the terms and conditions. The tour price will be 3498 all-inclusive. And so if you would love to come to Israel with us, we would love to have you. And we will be your tour host, and I'll be teaching you Bible prophecy on location. We have a, uh, wow, hey, Yoni, Yoni Yacobi, Boker Tov Haver. Guys, we got uh, a, a friend that I met in Israel, uh, a young Israeli man by the name of Yoni Yacobi, and I had the opportunity to talk with Yoni when we were at the rabbinic tombs at Beit Shireen, and him and I just got into a conversation and had an opportunity to give Yoni a, uh, a complete Hebrew Bible, and there's Yoni Yacobi right here in the room. Yoni, it's so good to have you with us, my man. Thank you so much. 
for tuning in. Man, it means the world to me uh, that you decided to join us uh, in this live stream today. So, man, great to have you in the room with us today. Yoni said, listen, if I have some more questions for you, I'm going to get in contact with you. So I said, Yoni, would love to talk with you some more. And so, great to have our young Israeli friend all the way from Israel joining us in the room today, Yoni Yakovi. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for tuning in today. So listen, again, if you want to go to Israel with us next year, the dates, March 24th to April 3rd, 2019, would love to have you. Lori Manis is using some Hebrew here. She says, Sababa. And of course, you all know what Sababa means. Uh, cool or awesome. And so I would love to have you join us for a Bible prophecy tour to Israel. And so when you have an opportunity, go to our bookstore or our store in general, order all those Holy Land gifts we just brought back from Israel. We're going to be updating that because we've got new items that are not really listed on the uh, website. So I'll have to update that later on. But well, we got these beautiful Israel baseball caps. They're white. They say Israel with the Israeli flag on it. Then we got Jerusalem handbags. Uh, we got all types of different stuff. Uh, necklaces and all that good stuff that you can order that we brought back from Israel. We even got ram's horns, shofars that you can order from our website. Biblical ram's horns. That goes all the way back to Genesis 22. The ram, its, its, its horn was caught in the thicket, became a symbol for the Jewish people. And so you can order shofars. You can order these ram's horns from us. So go to our bookstore, order my brand new book, Looking for the Promise of the Blessed Hope. Why you can still believe in the doctrine of the rapture. Order my other book, uh, Bible Eschatology, looking at geopolitical events in light of biblical prophecy. We got all types of uh, stuff that you could uh, order from our website. And remember, it's 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 your orders that helps us here in the ministry. But folks, not only do we depend on your orders, but we also depend upon your financial support that helps us to get around. Uh, traveling the USA, preaching on Yeshua and his soon return. Yeshua HaMashiach ben David ben Abraham, Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Yeshua, a Jew. Yeshua wasn't a Gentile. He wasn't, he wasn't even a Christian. Yeshua is a prophesied Mashiach of Israel who walked this earth 2,000 years ago. In Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the house of bread. Was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. One individual that will die for the sins of many. Isaiah 53 isn't talking about the sufferings of the nation of Israel collectively. The rabbis have a wrong interpretation there. You know, how can Israel die for the sins of Israel? And that makes no sense because Hashem, uh, God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, always required a perfect sacrifice. That's Leviticus 1.3, a sacrifice without blemish. And you can't say Israel is not without blemish. So that would disqualify, you know, Israel as being the subject of Isaiah 53. Isaiah, Ishiyahu Hanavi, talks about one individual that would die for the sins of many. He would give his life and offer it for all. And so Yeshua was a Jew. Yeshua was a rabbi. Born in Beit Lechem. Beit house, Lechem, bread. He was born in the house of bread. And that's why Yeshua, uh, Jesus in John 6.35, said, Ani Lechem Hai Chaim. I am the bread of life. So the bread of life was born in the house of bread. So Yeshua is indeed. I mean, how many rabbis do you know that raised people from the dead? That's what Yeshua did 2,000 years ago. How many rabbis do you know 
that can defy gravity by walking on the water of the Sea of Galilee. The only one that I've known that have done that was Yeshua, Jesus. How many rabbis do you know that have caused the blind to see? That's what Yeshua did 2,000 years ago. How many rabbis that you know that defy death in the grave by rising from the dead? Well, that's what Yeshua did 2,000 years ago. So this wasn't some ordinary man. This was the God man. This was the prophesied Messiah of Israel. And if the rabbis of Yeshua's day in the first century AD, if they would have only read the Tanakh, if they would have only read the Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, Berich HaDashah, the Law, the Prophets, the Writings, if they would have read those Messianic prophecies, they would have clearly, they would have clearly saw that those prophecies pointed to Yeshua as their fulfillment. But because the rabbis of Jesus, they rejected him, you know, because of, like Tommy the Milkman on Fiddle on the Roof would say, Tradition, tradition. Tradition blinded their eyes. And they got caught up in man made tradition, the laws, and the opinions of the rabbis. And they failed to have read the messianic prophecies of the scriptures. And because of their rejection, and 2,000 years later, unfortunately, Israel is still in rejection of her Messiah. Because of that, Yeshua prophesied of the temple's destruction and the Jews being scattered to the four corners of the earth. Jesus prophesied that 40 years before it even happened. How would he how would he have known that if he was just some, you know, mere man? Well, he was more than a man. He was the God man, the hypostatic union of perfect man and perfect God. And yet. He was the perfect sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. That's what Melech David, King David, prophesied in uh, Tehillim, Psalm 22, that the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. And yet, in Matthew 27, 35, it says, and Yeshua was crucified. The perfect Lamb of God, prophesied as well by Yohanan HaMakbil, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, not John the Baptist, but John the Baptist. You know, looked at Jesus in John 1 29, John 1 36, and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. <clears throat> and that's what he did, folks. And he can take away your sin when you call upon him in faith. Ask Yeshua to forgive you of your sins. Ask Yeshua to come into your heart to be your Mashiach, your Messiah, your Lord, and your Savior. And he will change and he will transform your very life. And he will make you a new person. And they said, well, do I got to stop being Jewish? No. Well, does that mean now I got to eat ham sandwiches on rye bread? No. Yeshua will add more to your Jewish faith as a Jew. And so trust in him as your Messiah and Savior. And he will change and transform your life, and he will make you a new creation. He will make you a new person. And Yeshua has been doing that <clears throat> for the past 2,000 years and continues to change the heart of men, Jew and Gentile. So I'll have more to say about this at the end of our program. But again, I want you to take your Bibles, and uh, we're going to continue to look at the passage we looked at yesterday, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Now, again, looking in the Barit Chadashah, where this is the New Covenant, or the New Testament. And we got to remember something. Again, another misconception within Judaism today 
is that the, the Berich HaDashah, the New Covenant or the New Testament, is a Gentile Christian book. Uh, and it must have been written somewhere in the United States of America. You know, it was probably written by a couple of Goy Gentiles in Rhode Island, a couple of Goy Gentiles in Washington, maybe a few more Goys in Dallas, Texas. A bunch of Goys got together and decided to write the Berich HaDashah, this Gentile Christian book that we Jews don't believe in. Well, here's the problem with that thinking. The Berich HaDashah, or the New Covenant, or the New Testament, was not written by Gentiles. It was written by Jews. And where was this Berich HaDashah written? Was it written in China, America, Portugal, Spain? Was written in the homeland of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. <clears throat> All the authors, ladies and gentlemen, of the Berich HaDashah, the New Testament, were all Jews, not Gentiles. They were Jews who were believers in Yeshua, Jesus. <clears throat> they were written in the homeland of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And yes, some of these other New Testament books were written outside the land of Israel, but by Jews, <clears throat> for example, like Paul the Apostle. Paul wasn't a Gentile. Paul was a Jew. By the way, Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. I know that. Based on Romans chapter 11 verse 1 and Philippians chapter 3 verse number 5, Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin. Just like Saul, Israel's first king, according to 1 Samuel 9.21, Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul, or well, his name was Saul in the beginning as well, before it was changed to Paul. But well, Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he wrote most of the Pauline epistles as a rabbi, as a Jew within that area of Asia Minor at that time. Not that far from Israel, but still written outside the land of Israel, the Gospels were written by Jews. Matthew, Mark, even Luke was a Jew. I don't believe he was a Gentile. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Yohanan, John. The Gospels, written right there in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel. The Pauline epistles, written outside the land, not too far from the land, but written outside the land in the area of Asia Minor. So all the authors of the Bible, both the Tanakh, Old Testament, were Jews. In the Berich HaDashah, the authors were all Jews. So that's a big misconception within Judaism today. That the New Testament is a Christian book. It is a Gentile, uh, a Gentile book written by Gentiles, and it's to be rejected. That is not true. They were all written by Jews. All right. Let me digress on that matter and continue the reading here. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. We don't want the things of the world. We don't want the spirit of this world, because the spirit of this world is the spirit of Antichrist. <clears throat> but we want to know the, the truth by the things which were given by God, Paul said. And then in verse 13 he says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. You see, this is the problem, not only within Judaism, but also the problem within Christianity, is that we embrace the words of the rabbis. We embrace the words of church leaders, and we end up departing from the authority of the scriptures. That's a major problem within rabbinic Judaism today, and it's a major problem even within the church today. We must allow the scriptures to take precedent 
the final authority over the word of man, whether it's a rabbi or some pastor, it must take precedence over the word of man, period. You know, even in a lot of our churches today, you know, we have a church constitution. And it's sad today that we end up taking the church constitution and putting it over the authority of the word of God. The word of God trumps any church constitution. And the word of God trumps any rabbinic tradition. Make no mistake about that. So I continue to read verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 2. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teach it, but which the Holy Ghost teach it, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The word of God, ladies and gentlemen, it must be the final authority in all faith and practice. The Bible must be the final authority. Not a rabbi, not a pastor. The word of God must be the final authority. And that's the reason why we're, we're looking at the interpretation of Bible prophecy, because Bible prophecy was meant to be understood by the common person, not the educated, not the one that has a PhD or a doctorate of divinity or MVID or Micades, whatever you want to call it. Bible prophecy was meant to be understood by the common person. That's why we looked at yesterday, we looked at the myths concerning Bible prophecy, the truth concerning Bible prophecy, uh, the principles of Bible interpretation, looking for the surface of the meaning according to Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy simply means what the Bible says will happen in the future concerning Israel and concerning the Gentile nations of the world. God has a program for Israel. And by the way, God is not finished with Israel. God has not abrogated any of his promises to the Jewish people. That's another big fallacy that's going on in the church today and along, among many Bible seminaries. That God is finished with Israel. That's a lie. That's right from the pits of hell. But that's being propagated <clears throat> behind the pulpits of America today, Bible colleges and seminaries, and among those who adhere to reform theology. Let me tell you something about reform theology. Reform theology is dangerous. You know why? What does reform mean? It means to change, to divert. That's pretty much what it means. That's why Hebrews 13 8 says, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the same, he never reformed, the same, yesterday, today, forever. And the word of God, the same applies. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Man may change. And his theology may change, but God's word never changes. So if you see a church that would even say reform theology, or even some of those churches that say so-and-so covenant church, you better be very careful. What I want to look at is, as we look at the study of Bible prophecy, is that you must consider the context. You've heard this before. Context, context, context. It's very important that when we study Bible prophecy, that we look at it in context. The problem within the church today, among many, is that we take one Bible verse, and then we place doctrine on that one Bible verse. You can't do that, folks. You got to look at the text in its complete context in order to ascertain 
what the mind of the author was getting at. And this is what we, we, we fail to do within the church today. You gotta always keep in mind the context because context determines the meaning of the words. A word in one context may be, may be symbolic, whereas in another context it may be literal. So if we have all the symbolism within the context, well, how do you interpret this symbolism? you got to let the scriptures interpret the context. Remember what we talked about yesterday. The four major apocalyptic books of scripture. Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, and Revelation. Those books use apocalyptic literature. So that means you're going to find symbolism left and right within those books. So how do you interpret the symbolism? By scripture. You compare scripture with scripture in order to ascertain more information. You interpret through context. Remember, context, context, context. If the Bible uses allegory, well, then the Bible itself is going to give you the interpretation of the allegory of the allegorization if you will for you know for example psalm chapter 50 and verse number 10 god says that you know god owns a cattle on a thousand hills well it all belongs to him but the context makes it clear that the word thousand well obviously it would be symbolic but in revelation chapter 20 we are told six times that the lord is returning to reign for a thousand years the context makes it clear that the word thousand is literal so in psalm chapter 50 verse 10 the word thousand well that's just simply meaning that god owns it all he owns the universe he owns the world he owns all the planet so obviously the word thousand in psalm 50 verse 10 would be symbolic and the literal interpretation of that symbolism in psalm 50 verse 10 is that god owns it all he owns the literal land he owns the literal creation it all belongs to him but then when we get to revelation chapter 20 Verses 2 through 7, we see six times the word thousand years. That's where we get the word millennium from. Even though the word millennium doesn't appear in the Bible, we get it from two Latin words. Malay, thousand, anum, years. So when we combine those two Latin words, Malay, anum, millennium, we get thousand years. There is no rhyme or reason whatsoever, folks, to allegorize or spiritualize Revelation chapter 20 to say it means something else. And that's what the amillennialists do. They'll look at Revelation 20, 2 through 7 and say, well, it doesn't really mean what it says. Well, really? Well, what does it say? Well, we're not really sure, but it doesn't really mean what it says. Well, my friend Dr. Dave Reagan of Lamb and Lion Ministries belonged to a, a reform church for years the church of christ actually he grew up in that denomination most of his life and of course their reform uh they you know adhere to replacement theology that god has done with israel and that god has replaced israel with the church and he heard a sermon one day from his pastor in which his pastor said there is no scripture that teaches that in the future Jesus' feet will touch planet Earth. There are no second coming passages at all. And Dave Reagan grew up believing that. And he would go around, he would go around and say, Oh, the Bible doesn't teach a second coming. Oh, sure, there was a first coming, but the Bible never teaches a second coming. And there is no scripture to support a second coming. 
That's what my pastor says. And my pastor's got to be right. He is the pastor. So Dave Reagan believed that. One day in his own personal Bible study, Dave Reagan came across Zechariah 14 and verse number 4. On that day, shall his feet touch the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, on the east. And he looked at that and he says, wow, wait a minute, that sounds like a second coming passage to me. My pastor said that Jesus will never step foot on the earth again. But why? what is Zechariah 14 for all about? It says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives on the east of Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount. He was really concerned with that passage. So he went to his pastor. He said, Pastor, you were teaching. Yeah, Jesus will never step foot on the earth again. He says, that's right. He said, you said there are no second coming passages. He said, that's right, Dave. What's the problem? He said, well, in my own personal studies, I came across Zechariah 14.4, where it says, and on that day shall his feet touch the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Well, his pastor said, really? Where does it say that? It goes right here, Zechariah 14.4. His pastor looked at, took uh, Dave Reagan's Bible, looked at that verse, looked at Dave, looked at that verse again, looked at Dave with a very concerned look, looked at that verse again, looked at Dave, and then slammed his Bible shut. And he looked at Dave Reagan, and this is what he said. He said, son, I don't know what that verse means, but I'll tell you this, it doesn't mean what it says. Well, how convenient. And this is exactly what the amillennialists do. Remember what we said yesterday in our study? In the Greek, when you put the letter A in front of a word, it negates that word. So when we put the letter A in front of millennium, well, what does it mean? No millennium. So the amillennialists will look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 through 7, and they'll say, doesn't really say what it means. Well, listen, God says what he means, and he means what he says. We talked about this yesterday. God says what he means, and he means what he says. There is no justification whatsoever in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 through 7, to say that it means something else. Six times. Listen, if God said it once, that's good enough for me. But when he says it six times, I think we better listen up. There is no rhyme or reason, and there is no justification whatsoever to spiritualize Revelation 20 and say that it means something else. The context makes it clear that the word thousand years, or the phrase thousand years, is literal. So context is very important when we study the scriptures. Let me say hello to Cindy Marie Goddard, Robin Frazier. Good to see you, Robin. Sarah uh, Ag, a dear friend of ours out there in um, Ohio. Good to see her. Caleb Judge, good to see you, Brother Caleb. And Pastor John Grimes out there in Loosedale, Mississippi. Dear friends of ours, great to see them as well. So remember, it's all about context. If you take the text out of context, you'll end up with a pretext. And that is a major, actually it's a serious problem within the church today, especially among Bible prophecy teachers. Remember, context, context, context. What is context? Who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? What is he speaking about? If you're going to zero in on one Bible verse, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you say, well, this is the context and what it's talking about. This is the mind of the author of the, of the book of Scripture. And this is what he's saying. Who's speaking? Identify the author. Who's speaking? Who is he speaking to? Identify the group that he's talking to. Or the nation that he's talking to. Or even the, the individual that he's talking to. Who's speaking? Who is he speaking to? And in context, we'll put it in place. What is he talking about? 
context, context, context. It's very important. Then once you have once you have established the context, then it's okay to zero on that one verse and say, you know, whatever that verse is talking about. And of course, in terms of context, let the Bible interpret the Bible. I say this all the time. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Scripture is its own best interpreter. And I say that all the time. The Bible is its own best interpreter. A correct interpretation is always consistent with all the rest of Scripture. And that's the reason why we use parallelism. That's, in other words, you use one scripture to interpret another scripture. Parallel scripture is what we call it. So we compare scripture with scripture in order to ascertain more information. Revelation chapter 13 says that in the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. And many of them um, will escape on the wings of a great eagle. So, you know, you got guys who misinterpret and they'll give you all types of fanciful interpretations. So why don't we um why don't we go to Revelation chapter number actually let's go to chapter twelve. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 14 is what I want you to look at with me. Revelation 12 and verse number 14. And to the woman. Now, who's the woman here? Well, there are two women in Revelation. Now, women is symbolic. Okay? But we've got to look for a literal interpretation behind that symbolism. The Bible is always going to interpret that symbolism, not me. But the Bible. In uh, Revelation chapter uh, number 12, we have the woman here. Now, based on Revelation 12, 1, the woman would be the nation of Israel. How do I know it's the nation of Israel? Did I just take a guess and say it's the nation of Israel? Or would I say the woman here uh, would be, you know, the Baptist, the Pentecostals, or some other religious institution out there? No. Parallel passage. Based on my reading of Genesis chapter 37 and verse number 9, clearly the woman would be the nation of Israel. You know, because uh, when you read Revelation 12, 1, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head, the crown of 12 stars. Based on my reading of Genesis 37, 9, the sun would be Jacob, the moon would be Rachel, and the 12 stars would refer to who? Well, obviously, the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So when I compare Genesis 37, 9 along with Revelation 12, 1, well, the woman, the Bible just identified it for me, the woman is the nation of Israel. So we know that the woman is Israel in Genesis 12. However, when you get to Revelation 18, or I should say Revelation 17, we see another woman in the book of Revelation. Again, the symbolism is still, in, is still applicable here. Who is the woman in Revelation, 8, uh, Revelation 17? Well, when we read Revelation 17, 9, it gives us the geographical location as to where this woman sits. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. You don't need a PhD to figure this one out, folks. John the Apostle, a first century Jewish follower of Yeshua, Jesus, clearly in the first century, uh, in the first century context, what city did John have in mind? Well, that would be Rome. This woman, who was the false church, 
is centered. She occupies, she sits on a seven hill city called Rome. So the wise mind would make the wise interpretation. This is a false church that sits on a seven hill city that is today located in Rome. She's guilty of murdering God's people, Revelation 17, 6, Revelation 18, uh, 24. She's filthy rich, Revelation 17, and verse number 4, Revelation 18, verses 4 and 5. So we know exactly who John was talking about there in the book of Revelation. We're going back to Revelation 12, 14. And to the woman, that would be Israel. We're given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times plural, and half a time from the face of the serpent. We know based on Daniel 7:25, times, time, divided of times. Revelation, uh, Revelation 12, 14, times, times, and a dividing of times. Uh, Daniel 7:25 and Revelation 12:14. Those are Jewish colloquialisms. And that would refer to the last half of the tribulation period, the last three and a half years of the tribulation uh, period. So we know that the Antichrist would seek to annihilate the Jewish people. The Jews flee for their lives on the wings of a great eagle. And this is where all these fanciful interpretations come in from the mind of the reader, from the mind of the one that's trying to interpret. And this is where we get into all types of doctrinal trouble. Some have interpreted this to mean the United States of America because our symbol of America is the American bald eagle. And based on that, this has to be referring to the United States of America. America comes to rescue Israel and put her on an airplane and send her to America to protect her. Really? I mean, all I can say to that is, wow. And so, you know, they'll supply an airlift to rescue the Jewish people. But this exact same terminology, you know, of the uh, ego, uh, this same exact terminology is used to describe the escape of the children of Israel from the Egyptian bondage in uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse number 4, and as well as Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse number 11. In Exodus 19, 4, Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 11, God is the eagle. And the Jews escaped Egyptian bondage for the past 430 years on the wings of an eagle. And the Bible describes God as that eagle. The same applies to Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 14. It, all it means is that they escaped under the protection of God. Israel did it out of Egypt in Exodus 19.4 and Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse number 11. And in the future... Israel will escape from the Antichrist. They will flee to Petra in southern Jordan, where God will shelter and feed them and protect them there for a time, times, and half a time. Again, a Jewish colloquialism to refer to the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. It is, isn't it just amazing, ladies and gentlemen, that when you take the Bible for its plain sense interpretation, looking at context, 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 looking at parallel passages to ascertain more information, allowing the scriptures to interpret the scriptures, doctrine fits like a hand in a glove. But when, when you do what these guys are doing today on YouTube, these Bible prophecy teachers, that just go way out with fanciful Disney World interpretations, taking the scriptures out of context, basing doctrine on one Bible verse without taking it in context, allegorizing and spiritualizing the scriptures to death, 
to make it fit their brand of theology. That's the reason why the church today is in such a doctrinal mess. There is more false doctrine among Christians today being propagated in the church. Ladies and gentlemen, it's unprecedented. And something tells me that as we draw closer to the rapture of the church, it's going to get worse. And it's like God's going to have to come to rescue, rescue the church from itself. Never mind from the upcoming seven-year period of tribulation. And so we must allow the scriptures to interpret the scriptures. So the eagle in Revelation 12, 14, all it refers to is that Israel escapes under the protection of God. Just like Israel did out of Egypt under God's protection, God being the eagle. In Exodus 19, 4, and Deuteron <clears throat> excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> And verse number 11. So again, we must let the Bible interpret the Bible here. We also need to reconcile all scripture. you got to avoid hanging a doctrine, and as I said before, on one isolated verse. Again, this is where we get into doctrinal trouble. We take one Bible verse and we place all of this theology on one Bible verse. You've got to reconcile the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you got you have to reconcile the scriptures. All verses on a particular topic must be searched out. Uh, they must be compared. You compare scripture with scripture. And once you compare scripture with scripture, then all that scripture is reconciled. Reconcile all the word of God. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse number 10 says that when the Lord returns, the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. Now, if this were the only verse in the Bible about the second coming, of Jesus, we could confidently conclude that the heavens and earth will be burned up on the day that Jesus returns. But there are many other verses in both the Old and the New Testament which make it unambiguous and makes it abundantly clear that the Lord will reign over all the earth before the earth is con consumed with fire. Zechariah 14, 12 tells us, and this shall be the place where the Lord will smite all the nations that come up against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouths. But before all that happens, the Lord must reign on his throne, the throne of David, in the city of Jerusalem for 1,000 years before the earth is consumed with fire. Those verses must be considered together with the passage in 2 Peter chapter 3 in order to, in order to uh, get the correct overall view of scripture and believe me there are many out there Zechariah 14 12 2nd Peter chapter 3 verses 10 to 12 2nd Peter 3 13 14 uh, uh, we, we have to look at all those passages ladies and gentlemen we've got to reconcile the scriptures and then also you've got to watch for prophetic gaps. So what do I mean by that? The previous example points to the fact that there are often gaps in Bible prophecy. And of course, this is due to what is called telescoping. You know, like a submarine has a telescope. It's scoping out the surface of the water to see 
what's around it, even though it's under the water. The submarine itself is under the water. It is telescoping. <clears throat> this occurs when a prophet compresses the time interval between prophetic events. You know, it's like the prophet of the Old Testament would see the mountaintops. He might see three mountaintops. And he clearly sees on the first mountaintop, for example, he would see um, the death of the Messiah. On the second mountaintop, he would see the resurrection of the Messiah. On the third mountaintop, he would see the second coming of the Messiah. So he would see the death of the Messiah on the first mountaintop. Well, that's Psalm 22, crucifixion. He would see on the second mountaintop the resurrection of the Messiah. Well, that's Psalm 16 and verse number 10. And then he would see on the third tip of that mountaintop the second coming of the Messiah. Well, that would be Zechariah 14.4. But what he did not see were the valleys between the mountains. And within that valley, between the first and the second mountain, would be the church and the church age. The Old Testament prophets had no prophecy concerning that. And then between the second and the third mountain, that, that second valley, he would, uh, he would, uh, see other things or he wouldn't see other things so he wouldn't see the church he wouldn't see the church age so the this the reason this happens is due to the perspective of the jewish prophet himself as he looks into the future he sees a series of events but he does not necessarily see the uh, the time gaps between those events so again it's like looking at a series of mountaintops he's able to see the tops of the mountains but he's not able to see the valleys you know in Zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 through 10 there was a passage with three prophecies which are compressed into two verses but which are widely separated in time for example verse 9 says the Messiah will come humbly riding on an ass or riding on a donkey the first part of verse 10 says the Jewish people will be set aside. The second part of verse 10 says, the Messiah will reign over all the nations. Well, the first half of that prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus came down the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey, giving Israel one final opportunity to acknowledge him as their long-awaited Messiah. Israel dropped the ball. They said, no, you're not the Messiah. But when he continued to read on, the Messiah will reign over all the nations. Well, that didn't happen in the first century AD. It could have happened if Israel collectively would have acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus would have given them the kingdom right there on a silver platter. They, they dropped the ball. They blew it. The kingdom that the Jews prayed for for centuries, that they've longed for, it was right in their midst. They could have heard it right there. But Israel said, nope, you're not the Messiah. So now the kingdom is postponed. It's set aside until the future. And that will happen at the second coming of Jesus, the Messiah. So the second part of verse 10 says the Messiah will reign over the nations. Verse 9, the Messiah comes riding on a donkey. Verse 10, future, he will reign over all the nations. These three events, the first, second coming, the setting aside, of Israel, the reign of Jesus the Messiah, appear to occur in quick uh, succession. But in reality, there were 40 years between the first two events. And there have been almost 2,000 years thus far between the second and the third events. And again, the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible puts that all into perspective when we look at it for its plain sense interpretation. Again, I, I'm going to say it again. I say it all the time. You're going to say, why does he keep saying this all the time? 
If the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense, or you will end up with nonsense. And nonsense comes in when we fail to apply a proper biblical hermeneutic. Now, Tuesday, next week, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at how to beware of pre-filling. How to beware of pre-filling Bible prophecy. We're going to look at that come Tuesday. But tomorrow, Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, will be Friday Prophecy Q&A. Have those Bible prophecy questions ready for tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope that you make preparations to join us tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Sorry for a little bit of the lateness today. We're about maybe 10 minutes late, so we apologize to all of you. So I know that many, many came into the room, like Stephen Mitch Smith, Joe Isabel, a dear friend of ours. We go back uh, uh, to uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, back in the early 90s. Beverly Kinder, our landlord, they just live right downstairs from us. They're members of our church. Uh, Rolando Tiro Pacong, good to have them with us. Jason Diaz has joined us. Great to have all of you in the room with us today. I hope that these lessons have been a blessing to you as we are looking at the proper interpretation of Bible prophecy. If you apply, if you apply that rule of thumb, you know, from yesterday's study and today's study, I promise you this, folks, you're going to get the right doctrine. You're going to get the right Bible doctrine and avoid the nonsense that's out there among prophecy teachers on YouTube, on Christian TV, avoid all that nonsense, and you will get the right biblical hermeneutic. If you have any questions concerning the show, you can always contact me either through uh, the comment here or send me an email, august.todayinbibleprophecy at gmail.com. And, and don't forget, guys, if you want to join us in Israel next year, March 24th to April 3rd, 2019, my wife and I will be doing an 11-day Bible prophecy tour to Israel with one day in Petra in southern Jordan. So we'd love to have you join us in the Holy Land next year. I will be your personal tour host, your Bible prophecy teacher on location, and we will teach Bible prophecy right there on location in the Holy Land. Deborah says, thank you for today's message. Continue to pray for you and Patty. Thank you, Deborah. Appreciate you and your support. And Robin Frazier, good to see you. Hope all is well with you and your family. So again, tomorrow morning is Friday. Prophecy Q&A. Don't forget to tune in. And guys, listen. We're asking for all of you to help in our a brand new ministry that my wife and I are going to, it's not a brand new ministry. It's going to be a part of Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries. That's why we say ministries in the plural. Because we have many different ministries here. Bible prophecy, Jewish evangelism, and you know, and things of that sort. And so we're looking to create to the uh, the uh, to the lost sheep outreach. And which you know, my wife and I go to Israel and we share the gospel with the Jewish people by uh, giving them complete Hebrew Bibles, Old and New Testament. We need your help in that support and helping us, helping us, I should say, reach the Jewish people there in Israel. My wife and I want to go back in September to share the gospel with the Jewish people. And we can only do that through your financial help. And, uh, you know, that's what the people of Millbank Baptist Church in South Dakota, they raised two grand. To help us with the airfare to go out to Israel because they have such a burden for the Jewish people. They have the gospel, the Habesarah, as they say in Hebrew, to share the gospel with the Jews. And folks, we need your help with that. Would you please consider uh, giving? Even if you gave monthly, you know, 
25 a month, 20 a month, whatever, or a one-time gift to the Lost Sheep Outreach. And we haven't created that on the page yet, a website, but you can help give to that outreach by going to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org, scroll down to the very bottom of the page, see the donate button, click that donate button, and put whatever amount the Lord lays in your heart. And just make sure that you put in there to the Lost Sheep Outreach. And we, we'd like to raise at least 2500 for September for my wife and I to go back to the Holy Land and share the gospel with the Jewish people. Would you please prayerfully consider, if you love Israel, you love the Jewish people, would you prayerfully consider helping us with that? You can also mail your support to the Lost Sheep Outreach by sending your gift to Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries, 55 Pleasant Street, Apartment 2, Lincoln, Rhode Island, 02865. You know, this rabbi, a messianic rabbi, I talked to in Israel last October when he found out what we were doing there in Israel. He said, wow, I am just absolutely blown away, August. I mean, my good friend Gary Frazier introduced them to me, and now they provide Bibles out there for us. He said, August, I see Christians coming to Israel, but they never share their faith with the Jews. You know, he goes, I, I, I've, I've seen, you know, seminar, uh, uh, seminars on Jewish evangelism, how to reach the Jews, but yet these guys never come to Israel and do that. They hold seminars on it, but they never come here and do it. This is what a Messianic rabbi in Israel is telling He says, even Messianic Jews here in Israel never share their faith with the Jews. He says, but yet you're coming 5,800 miles away from America, here to the Holy Land. And you guys are sharing the gospel with the Jews. He goes, I want to make sure that I provide the Bibles for you to do so. And that's what they've been doing. And that's what we do, ladies and gentlemen. We're not going to Israel to vacation. We don't vacation when we're there. When we go to tours, it's not a vacation. It's a, it's a study. But my wife and I passed out 17 Bibles. That doesn't sound like a lot. But for the 10 days that we were there, we passed out 17 Bibles. We even ran out. We had to get some more to pass out. We had to go to Christ Church in Jerusalem to do exactly that. And so when we go there, this time I want to get at least 20, 25 Bibles to pass out. And we can only do that, ladies and gentlemen, through your financial support. Would you please help us to do that? Would you please consider giving a financial gift to... Uh, to the uh, to the lost sheep outreach, and you'll know that you will have us as your man on the ground there in Israel, sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. And we want to thank you in advance to that. And by your donation, by your financial gift, God will credit that to your heavenly account. And I don't know if Jews are going to come to faith when we share the gospel with them. Going soul one in Israel is totally different than it is in America. You just can't, you just can't go out in the streets with a big speaker. And I know some people do that, and it's absolutely stupid in my opinion. They go to Israel with a big bullhorn, like they do in America. Big bullhorn, you know, a bunch of gospel tracks on the side. Repent of your sins if you die today. You, you don't, you just don't do that in Israel. I mean, you're asking for some serious trouble, man. And you're only drawing attention to yourself. You're not drawing attention to the Lord. I don't. I, I can't stand this provocative evangelism. It, it, it's a big turnoff to me, personally. I'm not there to draw attention to August Rosado or Patty Rosado. I'm there to draw attention to the Lord Jesus. And that's what we do. So, please pray about helping us out. With the uh, to the lost sheep outreach, and again we want to say thank you in advance. Well, again, guys, I hope to see you tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for Friday prophecy Q and A. Have those Bible prophecy questions ready for tomorrow, and remember, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon, and Shalom Yerushalayim.
pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we'll talk to you, Lord willing, tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, for Friday Prophecy Q&A. All right, guys, have a great day in the Lord, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.